You may be seated. I hereby open the commencement exercises of St. Vladimir's Orthodox Theological Seminary for the mid-year commencement 2023-2024. On behalf of the entire seminary community, I want to welcome all of you to this annual lecture honoring the memory of Proto-Presbyter Alexander Schmemann. Over the years, there have been a variety of speakers which are listed in your program. They all focus upon topics which were, of course, dear to Father Schmemann. One immediately thinks of things liturgical, pastoral, homiletical, all of those things. Tonight, we have the great pleasure of hearing a scholar who in many ways touches upon all of those points of interest for Father Schmemann. We have uh, several hundred people who are participating in this lecture this evening uh, on a virtual basis. And so in your programs, we have an introduction to Dr. Robin Darling Young, and I will read it for those who are listening in virtually. Robin Darling Young is ordinary professor of church history at the Catholic University of America in Washington, DC. She works in the field of early Christianity in the Eastern Roman Empire, concentrating on Greek, Syriac, and Armenian Christian cultures and texts. Recently, she has co-edited and translated Avagrius of Pontus' letters in Armenian and has been chief translator of Avagrius of Pontus' the Gnostic trilogy. Professor Darling Young is now writing a book on the philosophy of Avagrius and is revising a new translation of Origins Contra Selim with her friend and colleague J.W. Trigg for the Graphide series of Dumbarton Oaks. She has served on the official U.S. Eastern Orthodox Roman Catholic Dialogue and belongs to both the U.S. Oriental Orthodox Roman Catholic Dialogue and the International Theological Commission. As we begin this evening, it's also an academic convocation. So we'll be conferring two degrees, the Doctor of Ministry degree, and I would ask Dr. Tadori to come forward for the conferring of the degrees. By virtue of the authority vested in the Board of Trustees and the Faculty of St. Vladimir's Orthodox Theological Seminary by the Board of Regents of the University of the State of New York, the degree of Doctor of Ministry is conferred upon Reverend Gregory Nicholas Christakos. and Reverend Theodore Paraskevopoulos. As usual for each and every uh, Doctor of Ministry recipient. I am calling now Reverend Gregory Nicholas Christakos to share his thoughts after this long period of gestation of his uh, dissertation. Father. Reverend Hierarchs, Reverend Fathers, brothers and sisters in Christ, um, it is an honor to be here speaking about the, just a few words about the Doctor of Ministry program. Um, I'm a graduate of the University of Virginia, founded by Thomas Jefferson, of course, and one of his pithy sayings was, uh, learning never ends. So the custom at UVA is, you're not a freshman or a junior or what have you, but you're a first year, a second year, third year, learning never ends. So the thought of 
Um, when I started this program, I, I heard it was a terminal degree and that just never made sense to me. And yes, it's terminal in the sense it's the last degree after the uh, Masters of Divinity, but it's really a beginning. And the classroom component of the program, I can very much say has made me a better priest, made me a better ministry leader. The writing process and the work involved in that has inspired me even after all these years to want to do more writing and, and hopefully produce things that in some way will help the church, even, even in, a, in a small way. Um, any program, of course, is only as good as the people in it. And we were blessed to have such a great co a cohort, um, the teamwork with the people in the program, the inspiration, the criticism, constructive that we gave each other. Um, all of that came into has come into play. The instructors were amazing. Um, my family, which I really have to thank for their patience throughout this process, and uh, especially our advisors. And I want to especially acknowledge um, Father Sergius, who has shown not just infinite patience, but um, has been a true mentor throughout all this. And I would not be here without him. Um, he called me one time and I answered the phone by saying to him, you have achieved the same status as my Metropolitan. When I see you calling, I have to pick up. And if you think about it, a bishop, an episcopos, is an overseer, and that's exactly what an advisor is, so it's it's very fitting. Um, I'm happy to see that we have a lot of students here, and I would urge you to strongly consider when it's the appropriate time to, to enter this program um, after you get your master's degree. And in priest talk, strongly consider means you need to do this, and it it is really, it is that valuable of a program. Thank you all. The second re recipient is Father Theodore Paraskivopoulos. Father, please. I have to adjust. Hmm. So just before I start, uh, Father Gregory said that this is a terminal degree. But considering my topic is about death, I have no problem with that. <laughs> um, your beatitude. Uh, your graces, Reverend Fathers, and esteemed faculty, fellow graduates, and honored guests. Today, as I stand before you, I am filled with profound gratitude and great humility as I accept this esteemed Doctorate of Ministry degree. This moment represents the culmination of the last nine years of, of my life. I stand here not only as an individual, but as a member of a vast brotherhood of clergy who labor tirelessly in Christ's vineyard attempting to bring hope to the hopeless, consolation to those suffering, and a support to those who are struggling. Often we feel our abilities are lacking inadequate, uh, are lacking and inadequate for the task before us. At those times, the words of the great hierarch, St. John Chrysostom, one of which we celebrate today, reminds us, the physician of the soul should not always apply remedies, but sometimes be content with putting the patient in suitable conditions to nature's working. In other words, we must always remember that while we are not Christ, we do have the ability to facilitate an encounter with him. As a minister, I'm acutely aware that our role extends beyond simply prescribing remedies for the soul. It is our duty to create an environment that fosters healing, growth, and meaningful transformation. St. John's words remind us that at times, this means stepping back and allowing the inherent power of God's grace to take its course. I would like to express my profound gratitude to all those who have contributed to my journey, along with all of us in our cohort, but especially for me, my wife, Joanna, and our three children, George, Katarina, and Angelo, who were not able to come from Canada today. My parents, George, and and sisters, Persitera Stamatia, and her husband, Reverend Father Kostadinos Khadzis, who is also an SVS alumni here, and my little sister, Maria. Along with my in-laws and all my extended family members, I thank them for their unwavering support and endless encouragement and patience in this long, long process, as Father Gregory mentioned as well. Uh, my deepest gratitude to my spiritual father, the very, very Reverend Father Peter Avgaropoulos, who's also an SVS alumni and valedictorian, um, and as well as all my spiritual mentors. I would like to also express my love and indebted indebtedness to my longtime friend and brother, Mr. Peter Andranistakis, who's here tonight, who's without friendship, support, and sponsorship to this, doc uh, this doctorate would not never have been completed. My heartfelt appreciation to the esteemed faculty and members and staff of St. Vladimir's who have tirelessly invested their time and expertise in my education, 
the demon director, Father Sergius, my thesis supervisor, Father Gregory Edwards, who couldn't be here tonight but was here this morning, uh, your passion and pursuit of knowledge combined with your steadfast commitment to the principles of ministry have instilled within me a, the deepest desire to serve with the utmost dedication. Lastly, I want to express my gratitude to the triune God, the ultimate healer and, so, and source of all knowledge. It is through his divine grace that we are equipped to serve others, and it is his presence that sustains us and as we face adversity. The acceptance of this degree serves as a reminder of the immense responsibility placed upon us to be the conduits of God's love and mercy. To my fellow clergy in my cohort, who have now all finally run the course of this particular study, and as I stand here, ready to embark on this new chapter of my journey, I am reminded of the wise words of St. Ignatius of Antioch, who said, Wherefore, placing myself under your gracious indulgence, I beg you to make my joy complete by laboring with me in love. I pray we all continue to labor in this love together. Thank you. Readjust. Now please join me in welcoming Dr. Robin Darling Young. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I should have sorted this out ahead of time. <laughs> okay. Okay, so I will just begin. Now you know where we are. <laughs> Um, my hat is distracting me, so I'm taking it off. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> first of all, first of all, is that better? Um, I'm very glad and very grateful to be here tonight. Um, I have, <clears throat> I've come to visit St. Vladimir's before. Um, in fact, uh, as, uh, as my former student Vitaly Permyakov mentioned, I I have come more times than I remembered, <laughs> uh, and here I met wonderful friends and good students. Um, a couple of my students are here tonight, in addition to Vitaly, and I'm very happy to see them. Um, um, and I also want to say how much I uh, learned from the writings of Proto-Presbyter Shmeman. Um, he, was, uh, he was a truly amazing person. He trained a couple of my friends um, whom I know in Washington. And one of them said something to me that I, I realized only later was extremely profound. And so I'm going to repeat it. Um, we were we were uh, having a discussion uh, one night, possibly of Pavel Florensky, and I said one of the most depressing things I ever hear on my side of the street is, um, "Let's get mass over with," and and he said he said, "Oh, you Catholics, you have so many things. You have schools. You have convents. You have hospitals." And we Orthodox have only the liturgy. And I didn't realize until much later um, that I was actually Martha in the in the parable, and he was speaking of Mary. He's a wonderful man, and I thank him. Um, and now for my talk. Uh, we'll stay we'll stay here in, in arid Egypt for a while. The mind is just as amazing to early Christians as it is to us, sometimes alluring and sometimes terrifying. We have only to think of the work of Pavel Florensky or of Sergei Bulkakov at the beginning of the 20th century, as well as the terrifying minds I pass over in silence. 
The magnificence of Florensky, bedazzled as a child by the flora and fauna of the Caucasus, where he lived as a boy and young man. Or for instance, or on the other side, the plots of the notorious rat line in my own church, protecting mass murderers and shuttling them to safe prosperity in another part of the world, where many of them would live out their lives in the safety they had stolen from their victims, thanks to the machinery of the state they worked for. Each group had minds, and they used them for different things. In this lecture, I want to discuss the mind of the rational human being as Evagrius understood it, and not just the human being, but the rational being as Evagrius understood it. Our minds suited and even intended for detailed painstaking inquiry into the natural world seen and unseen and into ourselves likewise seen and unseen and for beholding the structuring reasons, the logoi of ourselves and the world as we see it. And through that beholding, the theoria, beholding the outer edge, if I may use a topographical metaphor of the divine being who has and is always generating all and whose creation has been structured to make possible this beholding. I readily admit that Evagrius has been difficult for Christianity to accommodate, and I will return to this later. Um, soon after his death, only a year after his death, uh, certain authorities, even later scribes, felt they needed to subject him to a kind of surgery, retaining the apparently useful or beautiful and disposing of the unsightly, even the, uh, uns sorry, unsightly wrinkles, even the wrinkles in time. But I want to say that if we take, can take three, no, two examples of how humans can be jolted out of the everyday, of the progression of time, according to sundial or clock, we can move our minds or allow them to be moved in a state that will appreciate what reading Evagrius's works, even as they now exist somewhat damaged by those who were frightened of him, we will be in a position to benefit from the massive work he did for what he called Christianus Moss, the Christian path over 1600 years ago. And the reason of course he is still useful is that the human mind is the same. The first example, I give is the, is the relativity of space. Every year on the feast of Prophetus Elias, the people of the Mani Peninsula, a rugged people who resisted conversion up to the second millennium, most of them, go up to the highest peak in the Tigatos. Um, that, excuse me, um, they there on July the 30th, the Maniotes and their heart, hardier visitors go there because it was there, right there, that he ascended in his fiery chariot to heaven. For those who don't want to make the climb, there's always Cardamele, where you can have a sight of the fire. But of course the event didn't happen there. It was on Mount Carmel, or it was Jebel Myelias in Jordan, east of the river near Tishbe, his birthplace, where pilgrims can now see the spot. And it is also, it is also, remembered and participated in on the, uh, uh, excuse me, on the islands of Sifnos, Tinos, and Rhodes, and near Zitza in Epiros. In all of these places, Prophetus Elias ascends to heaven. Another example from my own experience, so I advance it humbly, uh, flying to Iceland on the solstice one evening, and I don't have a word for this, for what happened, but flying on the solstice up in the northeast direction, precisely on the solstice, it was possible to see the sun both setting and rising. And that is an experience of the escape from time, although temporary, that I will, to which I will return at the end of my remarks. The person I'm wanting, uh, the, uh, whom I'm going to speak about tonight, 
was uh, born near a mountain, a mountain in the north of Asia Minor in the border area around the Iris River, where two young men are reputed to have sought the divine one through philosophy and its path. And in this case, because they are Christians, the path were Christians, are Christians, the path hinted at in scripture. They may have had a younger companion, the son of a core bishop and the student of Gregory, that is Evagrius. The other man, of course, was Basil. He's in the generation that's still bearing the name, names of Greek gods. The name Evagrius, just for your amusement, means lucky in the hunt. Um, his father was a bishop. <laughs> Uh, he might himself have thought he was he was lucky because, of course, at some point he became a demon hunter. He lived in the Pontic borderlands where the Greek colonies had ended and the reach of Persia still expressed itself in the unmentionable fire temples and other ethnic religions in the area at which Basil hints in his letter, especially in his letter to Epiphanius. Evagrius, though, left his homeland, first, as he attests, for the course of studies in local schools, and then tutorship by Gregory Nazianzus, Gregory of Nazianzus, and then possibly to study at the same time as Chrysostom with Libanius. Um, now, um, he he um, went. It, could I just have the first, the second slide, and then I want to go back to this slide. I'm sorry. Um, if you, you can't see the very north of Asia Minor, but you can see close to Constantinople, and you can see the two main areas that um, Evagrius would, uh, where Evagrius would spend the rest of his life. One, Rome and Judea, of course, this is a contemporary map, uh, and the second is near Alexandria in the Delta of Egypt. And now could I go back to the first slide? Thank you. Um, um, Evagrius, because his father was a, core, was a core bishop, because he was a student of Gregory of Nazianzus, an assistant to Basil, and so eerily similar in thought to Gregory of Nyssa that they're likely to have known each other, the young Evagrius had many what we would call opportunities. Um, and these opportunities are indicated in the biography that everyone depends upon, namely the chapter on Evagrius in Palladius's Lausiac history. We can hear in that history the hagiographic drum roll, swift rise to be assistant to Gregory of Nazianzen in Constantinople, a moral failing, an involvement with the wife of a high official, near disaster, an angelic intervention in a dream, his retreat to Jerusalem, his advice from Melania, his travel to Egypt where he composed his works, all monastic. Before, he was a McKinseyite of the fourth century, after, a self-punishing ascetic, this is in the this is in the hagiography, who instructs many and whose teachings pass on through his students. Palladius in the history dedicated to Lausus, John Cassian, and many others who read his work. He possibly had learned from his teacher the practice of synkatabasis, that is accommodation to the level of your students and the salutary concealment uh, Palladius conveys only the monastic side of Evagrius's life. But as my colleague Joel Calvismacki has shown in a recent article, Evagrius did not write all his works in the desert. Um, or actually, it's not the desert as you can see, it's a kind of, it's kind of a uh, um, distant suburb of Alexandria. Uh, it's impossible to live in the real desert. Um, Calvus Mackey shows that Evagrius was already working on his major works much earlier than his residency in Egypt, and he has recently demonstrated this in a journal article. Uh, and he gives the reason that 
in the Kephalionostica, there is only there is no mention of demons, and there are no is no mention of a monk. So what this suggests is that Evagrius was writing long before he became a solitary. His experience in Constantinople may be reflected in his treatise Perilogismon on calculations or thoughts. Logismoi, calculations, are what we do when we make plans or when we scheme. There he seems to discuss, that is, in his treatise on calculations, his firsthand experience in the city and its effect on an ambitious man who could well be himself or someone he knew. That experience, the experience of plotting, scheming, greedily accumulating, thinking of what it would be like to be the chief oikonomos of the archdiocese, taught him not to have expectations of the archdiocesan office, and in fact, to avoid an office that would subject him to immense temptation. Such temptations rejected by Christ at the beginning of his own ministry, and Evagrius identified with Christ, or he came to at the same time, Evagrius's training had taught him to think of himself within the compass of the oikonomia of the Lord. That oikonomia is the arrangement for the kingdom of God to find, reach, and bring to itself each rational being present in this world, or if we to, are to include everyone in all worlds, visible and invisible. The inexorable reach of this kingdom would be frightening in its ability to search and find all search for and find all rational beings were it not the provision for each alienated person to begin the long road upward and back to their origins around and belonging to the divine logos of course the logos has visited this world in an epidemia not limited to the time of the first century in Palestine, see Isaiah 52, 9, but recorded in the books of the Old Testament, establishing his kingdom benevolently for the restoration of, of his entire creation. Here, Evagrius's wider understanding of the cosmos and of its restoration rests upon the writings of his of three main predecessors, Origen, Clement, and with them, of course, Philo. The three Alexandrians who understood that scripture and Greek philosophy were complementary, looking for the same telos, the same end. But Evagrius writes differently from his three predecessors and from his contemporary Didymus the Blind, also of Alexandria. And could we have the next slide, please? Yes, I just have to show him to you um, because um, this is the person who summarizes Clement and who um, inspires Evagrius and who in this uh, Latin medieval manuscript illumination is shown, I think, and I've had a discussion with others about this, is shown having trampled the serpent and using him as a stand upon which to write his homilies. In this case, the illuminator has depicted him writing the homilies on numbers. Evagrius's literary corpus is not vast like Origen's, nor is it complex and interwoven with strands both barbarian and Hellenic, as as uh, Clement would say, long and discursive works are rare. Rather, he writes in compressed kephalaya that taken together create a landscape in which his sentences open and reveal their meaning only with repeated inquiry and meditation. Certainly, Evagrius approaches the moral reform of human beings as a first stage in their soteria, their healing, along with and by means of scripture, philosophy, and the paideia that encompasses them, 
in the way that his predecessors did. But new challenges met him to a significant degree different from those that met his earlier sources. And uh, could we have the next slide? Thank you. There. Now you will see the magnificence of the deacon of Constantinople receiving a diploma, perhaps, from Gregory of Nazianzus. For Clement and Origen, official prosecution of Christianity shaped how they trained Christians for a life public, political, and personal. And for the two of them, as for Philo, it was the philosopher or exegete who was to educate Christians to reach a level as high as they could in their return, their anabasis uh, to the Lagos. The practice of Greek philosophy in all its forms shaped Clement and Origen as it had Philo, and all three created a curriculum for their students and later their readers. As you can read, for instance, in Gregory Thaumaturgus's uh, uh, Panegyric of Thanksgiving to Origen. But for Clement and Origen, the rise of radically dualist Platonism interpreting scriptures dualistically and regarding the body as an obstacle at best and claiming to produce gnosticoi, the knowers, within small study circles, or in Origen's case of Marcionites, sundering the scriptures, retaining only a small section of the New Testament, these made them focus their works, creating an account of Christian learning that made a bulwark against both learned Jewish opinion especially in the case of Origen, especially in the Contra Celsum, and dualistic distortions of philosophy. Evagrius, as I think I've said too many times already, certainly read the writings of all three, and it can't be reasonably denied that his own writings are broadly Origenist. And to no, surpr and no surprise, this path was the most intelligent yet created in the early Christian intellectual world, the Cappadocians, one of whom you see here, followed it as well. But there are also differences, resulting at least in part from the changes that had happened over the century between Origen's death and Evagrius's birth. First, the growth of the church after the end of persecution and its ability to instantiate its teaching through imperial offices. Although scholars dispute the extent of that, then the multiplication of councils and the wider communication among members of the church hierarchy. And then the stubborn persistence of the tendency to fragment <coughs> scriptures, even the Marcionites survived into the fifth century, the increased national awareness, I use the term advisedly, as local languages grew for the expression of Christianity, thinking here of Coptic, Syriac, and Armenian. And finally, and most frighteningly, for many in this century, the spread of Manichaeism from east to west in the empire. Um, to its founder, a new and successor assembly or ecclesia, and to many, an appalling distortion. These developments, although only indirectly addressed in Evagrius's writings, certainly shaped his thought and likely determined his decisions. I've already mentioned his unconcealed view, diagnostic and devastating, of greed and power in the court of the Archbishop of Constantinople. He participated in it, he should know. Evagrius would hardly have been unaware of the weight of the imperial court upon the former, but perhaps more importantly, the beginning of the fourth century also saw the philosophical turn among the Neoplatonists directly against Christianity. Although Porphyry was not likely the cause of the great persecution, uh, his against the Christians combined with his mastery of the work of Plotinus and the works he wrote himself had shaken Christians. Just read Augustine. <laughs> um, uh, as did the work of the emperor Julian later in the century, bitterly attacked by the man on the right. Uh, your right, on your left, sorry. Um, Evagrius's works evidence a knowledge of Porphyry too, and even perhaps an attempt to steal his thunder by imitation. Porphyry's direct and indirect arguments against the Platonism of Christianity had to be incorporated, and Evagrius did that. But much of these connections are obscured because 
Many scholars who work on Evagrius take him as an isolated solitary, living and composing his work only in Egypt, only in his kela, which actually means a small house, um, uh, primarily for an audience of other solitaries who knew him, were instructed by him as described by Palladius, and used the training they had imbibed to guide their own lives as solitaries or monastics. Now, monastic communities can be highly permeable, and not only monks came to visit. Evagrius went back to Jerusalem at least once, and his letters may have circulated outside monastic circles. So the portrait of him as isolated in a remote cell can be put aside. He was a participant in the wider discussions of the fourth century. This is seen eminently in his discussion of the frame of creation, of oikonomia, and of its consummation, all in terms familiar, not only from the third century discussion, but from the contemporary Platonist, or, uh, Plot sorry, Plat Platonists, Plotinus, and Porphyry. So I'll turn to the two terms contained in the title of this talk. I borrowed a term, we all do, from Gregory of Nyssa to describe Evagrius' own position as a teacher of both ethics and philosophy in the Christian frame. He is methorios, stationed on the border and able to turn in each direction to the perceptible world or to the noetic in which reside the logoi or the structuring principles of created and visible things. Already in the practicos, he says, one who has grasps, grasped knowledge, gnosis, and harvested its pleasure, recognizable to all in schools, will no longer be persuaded by the demon of vainglory offering him all the pleasures of the world, for what could it provide greater than spiritual theoria? But to whatever extent we have not tasted knowledge, gnosis, we should eagerly engage in the practice, showing to God that our goal is to do everything for the sake of his knowledge. Or another in the practicus, remember your first life and the archaic faults and how while you were impassioned, empathes or disturbed, you departed from the cosmos that often humiliated you so often and in so many ways. He may be speaking of himself. And again, in the Gnosticos, quoting Didymus, train yourself always in the reasons about providence and judgment and try to remember their materials for almost everyone stumbles over these things. You will discover the reasons about judgment in the difference between bodies and cosmoi worlds and those about providence in the ways that lead us up from evil and ignorance to virtue and knowledge. Again, Gnosis. But what does cosmos mean here as singular and as plural? If he means what origin means, then the systema created of heaven and earth, or as, uh, then he means the systema created of heaven and earth, sorry, or as origin wrote in homily 14 on Jeremiah 15, 18, the text is, why do those who hate me prevail against me? Um, Origen writes, he, Jeremiah, had many troubles, pragmata, actually activities. He suffered from those who did not want to hear the truth, and they were more powerful here in this aeon than he, since the kingdom of God is not out of this aeon, but from greater regions, chorion. As the Savior said, if my kingdom was of, of was of this cosmos, my servants would fight that I'm that I might not be delivered to the Jews. Close quote. Those then who afflict the prophet prevail against him in this cosmos. This is still our origin talking. About their prevailing, look at the witnesses, the martyrs. The judge sits in the courtroom, he judges and is comfortable. The Christian, in whom Christ himself is judged, is subjected to bitterness and is oppressed by the unjust and is contemned. Origen understands cosmos to mean the created and visible universe, whereas 
divine attributes are are ungenerate and ingenerate rather and everlasting aidios life but even when things look different to different observers such as the post resurrection appearances of jesus in the gospels this does not mean that there is a contradiction at the level of noose at the level at which the mind can appreciate the incarnate logos. He writes, just as with the supposed observers, we will not discover if all four of them are wise. He's talking about the gospel writers here. Any contradiction by extracting the intelligence from the historical accounts by which they wanted to make us grasp as by signs that their intelligence had contemplated from even even this is the for even this is the case we must understand for the four evangelists who used at their discretion many acts and words due to the prodigious and extraordinary power of Jesus and who in the framework of their writings sometimes inserted using expressions such as those used for what is in the sensible world realities which for them had only purely intelligible evidence. In other words, the writers of the Gospels lived in two time frames. They saw in two time frames. And this is what Origen expects his students to do, to be able to see in the time frame of the aesthetic, the sensible, which is the time frame of the of the of Kronos, of the Kronos side of cosmos but to move to Aeon, the eternal side of cosmos. Where does this come from, this distinction that Origen makes and that Evagrius will make? It comes actually from Timaeus 37d, um, but, Plotin but particularly Plotinus in Enneads 3.7, where he agrees with Plato and specifies that then which was, quote unquote, not, and quote, will not, unquote, be, but is only, which has being, which is static by not changing to the will be, nor ever having changed, this is the aeon. This life then, Plotinus goes on to say, which belongs to that which exists and is in being altogether and full completely without extension or interval, is that which we are looking for, eternity. And in, and in Plotinus's word, that is aeon, the outer edge, I would suggest, of aeon. Plotinus, who was a source for Evagrius, reflects a philosophy based upon the developed Greco-Roman view of time, chronos, a measurable, and therefore organizable thing. May I have the next slide, please? Pretty cool, right? Mm -hmm. um, were it not, there would not have developed sundials. I should have had a slide of that. Or for that matter, the Antikythera mechanism, which portrays the Aristotelian cosmos as systema, a connected whole of nested, geocentric spherical shells. This of course is not the Antikythera mechanism. You know, it was corroded over uh, two millennia. It is a computer reconstruction of it, the Antikythera mechanism, but so I think it's great. Each shell is the sphere through which a planet, including the five known planets and the sun and moon, all orbit orbiting the earth. The mechanism itself is meant to predict their movements over a cycle of years. Although the Antikythera mechanism, I have to say, was rendered obsolete by the calculations, um, later some of which have been shown erroneous, of Ptolemy and the Almagest and the planetary hypotheses, the nested sphere theory was retained until Copernicus. And this is the theory that would have formed the basis for the understanding of all educated people in the third and fourth century no matter if they're cultic practice or they're being Christian or Neoplatonist, and therefore for Origen and Evagrius after him. 
I can't tonight go into all the ways in which chronos is so important for a um, for someone like Evagrius trained in medicine. So please trust me on this. Um, uh, that mechanism, the mechanism of uh, the Antikythera, the so-called Antikythera mechanism, and others like it, even if with its faults, would have been useful mainly to one of the two possible types of human beings that Origen and later Evagrius spoke of, the cosmicoi, uh, people who live in the world, the cosmos. For Origen, cosmic, cosmicos applies to rulers of the kingdoms of this world. For Evagrius, a cosmicos is one who has not withdrawn into the ascetic practice or program of discipline leading to theoria in both its stages. And I'll just mention them here, uh, uh, Theoria Fusicae and Theoria Theologicae. Theoria Fusicae is describable. Theoria Theologicae is not describable. Um, such a person, a cosmicos, would attend to the motion of the stars for precisely what Evagrius wants to avoid, calculations. And because calculations were the requirement of the cosmos and living in the cosmos, not only could the cosmos be calculated as an intricately moving image of aeon, it could be turned to gain or to the satisfaction of desires. For Evagrius, the only way out of the sequence of pranas in the cosmos was to engage in detachment from all the activities pragmata that keep human beings attached to it. And this is where other minds come into play. Because for Evagrius as well as Origen, humans are not the only rational animals in the cosmos. There are demons that can act upon our thinking processes, causing further calculations to form, much more frightening than the Antikythera mechanism. These are alienated rational beings who make war against human beings and must be resisted and defeated now in your life and my life as they will be in the end. And there are angels, rational beings who, following the system of origin and periarchone, did not fall as far as the minds who became humans. They work too, but they do not work through calculations. They work in the realm of prayer and especially of insight, theoria. And I refer you to Evagrius Perilogis Mont 11 for a beautiful description of that, which I don't have time to recite. All rational beings can make the return. And Evagrius seems to think that all intellectual beings will uh, make that return over or in aeons. And this movement forms this to, to stir this movement forms the central purpose of all Evagrius' writings to make possible what Plotinus called the epistrophe, the return of all rational being to its origin and in an undifferentiated, sorry, undifferentiated state of insight into the divine that be, can be accomplished only when a human being becomes a Christ, the first of many brothers. The goal then of Evagrius' system was to move beyond cosmos and the chronos it imposed upon human life. Instead, the aeon was its goal, but only its intermediate goal. Could I have the next slide, please? This is a mosaic of aeon from um, the countryside around Rome, second century AD. And um, Evagrius would not have countenanced um, the undress of its uh, of its characters, but nonetheless, this is what he was talking about. Aeon is the is the band around the universe and the cosmos, who also knows where the cosmos stops, Aeon begins, and where Aeon stops. In other words, the outer border of Aeon. Everything I'm saying does not mean that Evagrius denied time, clock, or rather sundial time, as divided and recorded thanks to civic and private mechanisms. 
or for that matter, liturgical needs. He knew from experience and re from reflection that there were schedules and that minutes and hours passed and with them, uh, the chance to complete certain actions. After all, he had not completely abandoned Kronos when he went to live in Kelia. In a letter written to Theophilus, surviving only in Syriac, Theophilus was the Archbishop of Alexandria at that period, Ev Evagrius apologizes for failing to stop in Alexandria on his way back to Egypt from Jerusalem. I'm so sorry, he said, that I did not have the time to stop and see your eminence. My ship took me in a different direction. He did not want to be ordained bishop. We may assume that he is exercising synchatabasis when he writes to the bishop because he may have had, as I said, reason to think that Theophilus wanted to do to him what had happened to Serapion, whom Evagrius calls the angel of the church at Thamuis. There are many other exercises of his syncatabasis, which I would like to share with you, but time, the clock time demands that I not. Since the, uh, since the reign of Constantine, Jerusalem had been increasingly a city for pilgrims and for monumental buildings, pilgrimage sites, and hostels to accomplish them. I'm sorry, accommodate them. But Evagrius objected to the practice because it was misleading directing atten attention from the genuine, the real temple, the noetic temple, and the noetic priesthood, for instance, to the buildings, objects, and contention in the city. Rather, the important city was the city of God, the heavenly Jerusalem, not in its eschatological form, at least he didn't say that formerly, unless we understand eschaton in a certain way, but as the community of the noumenal world where perfect worship directed the Gnosticos and after him the Practicos becoming the Gnosticos to the true, true kingdom. May I have your next slide? And final slide. <laughs> um, Evagrius uh, is well known for his writings to monks, as I've said earlier. He's less well known for a series of writings uh, on Psalms, which is actually his largest work, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes. Why was he writing on those things? What does it have to do with monks? I think it has something to do with a kingdom, and particularly a kingdom with which he had had experience. So he writes in his... Uh, scolia on Ecclesiastes, and I'm quoting somewhat modified from the translation of a recently graduated PhD student who worked on these. An assembly it starts out, sayings of the assemblyman, the ecclesiast, the son of David, king of Israel in Jerusalem. He answers his que answer a question we don't hear him ask. An assembly, ecclesia, is true knowledge belonging to pure souls about ages and worlds and the judgment and providence in them. An assemblyman is a Christ. A churchman is the Christ, the begetter of this knowledge, or a churchman is the one who purifies souls through ethical theoriae, insights, and leads them to contemplation of natures. And the second, I will also read to you. To those who are entering into the intelligible ecclesia and are in wonder at the insight into created beings, the Logos says, O oh people, do not think that this is the final end stored up for you in the promises. For all these things are vanity of vanities in the face of knowledge of God himself. For just as medicine is vain after perfect health, so the logoi of the ages and worlds are pointless after one has knowledge of the, of the Holy Trinity. And I'll read you one final one from this set. Commenting on Ecclesiastes 1.11, there is no memory of the first things, in the Septuagint, of course, 
if there is no memory of the first things, how is it that David says, I remembered the ancient days and I remembered years of the ages? Perhaps then there will come to be forgetfulness of all these things once the rational nature receives the Holy Trinity. For then God will be all in all, 1 Corinthians 15, 28. For if the depictions of things that occur in thought processes lead the mind to recollection, and the mind that contemplates God, has insight into God, is separated from all depictions, then the mind that has received the Holy Trinity completely forgets all created beings. There are many more, <laughs> um, many more short sayings, scolia, on Proverbs and on Ecclesiastes, uh, with which I would like to, um, uh, I would like to, I'm, I'm, the word is not entertain, I would like to uh, share with you, um, but my student's book will be coming out eventually and you can read them for yourself. Evagrius clearly shows himself to be at the border of cosmos and aeon of the moving perceptible universe and the revolving yet eternally returning realm outside it, the aeon that seems plural, but is actually a repeating instance of the same thing into people move into which, sorry, people move, thus has a position. His position is that of a guide. His navigational tools are, as for all his companions, the scriptures in the Septuagint and Greek New Testament, whereby the language of both reflect the Greek terminology of its translators and underneath the Hebrew and Aramaic of the prophets and of Jesus. His mind he keeps clear of logismoi, logismoi calculations, not only for his own sake, but for the sake of those he guides, not as his subordinate subordinates, but those on the way to become what he, Evagrius, hopes to be. May I have the next slide, please? And he tells us, actually, in Perilogismon, what can come after the logismoi, the calculations, are defeated. Yes, this is Mount Tigatos. Um, he says, when the noose has stripped off the old man and put on that which comes from grace, then it will see its own state at the time of prayer its catastasis state, like a sapphire or the color of heaven, which scripture calls the place of God that was seen by the elders under Mount Sinai. But 40, the mind, the noose, cannot see the place of God within itself unless it is lifted up above all the concepts, noemata, of external objects but it will not be lifted up unless it strips off the pathe, the disturbances, the passions, enchaining it through noema to concepts of sensory objects. And while it puts away passions through the virtues, the more subtle calculations are laid aside through spiritual theoriae insights. And these in turn are laid aside when there appears to it that light, which at the time of prayer shapes within it a model of the place of God. Now, I want to end with a quotation, perhaps from an unlikely source, and that is um, a book by the wonderful um, Old Testament and um, early new early early Christian literature, uh, James Kugel. He writes in The Valley of the Shadow about the perspective from an airplane. He had recovered from what was going to be a fatal case of cancer. 
and he's discussing the loss of his two friends to cancer. He says, what does it matter if God or a defective gene somewhere chose to slice off a decade or two from their lifetime? Certainly not so much when one is 30,000 feet above the earth. Down there, of course, we cling to life, trying to squeeze every last minute out of it, and rightly so. It's all we've got. Yet somehow, we never quite manage to lose the mountaintop perspective. That is, the secret life of starkness in our brains. So we maintain a ghostly dealing with what is not at all our down here selves. This dialogue has absolutely no survival value, but we can't stop it. As a result, it is always going, whether we're aware of it or not. And when for a moment we are aware, we know it speaks the truth. He next discusses the details of his two dying friends and their recognition, and one of them is a woman, at the recognition, one, a woman, burst into tears. Kugel writes, well, of course, that's the life down here. But in her last week of life, she drifted in and out of a coma, ascending in jerky, Z-like motions to the top of the mountain. From way up here, I can see her. I can see you all floating. Thank you. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, right. Yes, I forgot. Sorry. Okay. So we have a few minutes for some Q&A. So a little bit of instruction. When you come to the microphone, uh, please speak clearly into it. Uh, and remember, we've already had the lecture, uh, so we don't need the second one. Make sure your question is concise and direct, and then we'll hear the response. So please also queue up. That helps us to keep it moving. So if you've got questions, please go to the microphone. Thank you very much. Uh, this is was so beautiful. Um, I have a question. Of course, the background is that we've, we've I've taken classes with you, and, and we talked about Evagrius in those classes. And uh, <clears throat> what I remember that, of course, there is some places on Evagrius, and there was some place which you mentioned that he discusses the temple and liturgy in some form. Yes. And so I will. The question would be. For me, very simple, but uh, uh, what is liturgy for Evagrius? And for and let me let me ask the same question in the same way. Um, what is how Evagrius is Evagrius a liturgical theologian? I think so. <laughs> I think he is. Um, I think he understands the liturgy as a work um, using its using its exact translation, uh, a holy work carried out in time, carried out in aeon that allows, and this is in his um, what I'm going to say is in his treatise to the monks. It allows a person to become a theologos. In fact, it is the way for a person to become a theologos and for him to become or her to become uh, another John leaning on the chest of Christ. Thank you.
Thank you for your beautiful talk. Um, sometimes I get the sense when reading Evagrius that what I'm supposed to do, I'm supposed to do like the, the practicos, the ascetic labor that I'm supposed to engage in is something that I do on my own. And yet you've written a lot about his, uh, his understanding of friendship and you've translated his letters. So I'm wondering how does friendship play a role in the effort to, to stand there between cosmos and Aeon? Oh. Um, that's very interesting. And thank you for the question, Mark. Um, I, I think any early Christian who discusses friend, what is a friend, is aware of what friend meant in the ancient world, which meant, um, well, not just what Aristotle thought it meant or Cicero thought it meant, that would be a relationship between equals, social equals. It could also mean a political position, as in, uh, as in a friend who, who, when the emperor would announce benefactions on a regular basis, a friend of the emperor would receive a benefaction. So I could become, theoretically, uh, you know, the governor of Bithynia, if I were a friend of the of the emperor, then anyway. Um, uh, but for Evagrius, friendship is what may occur among two human beings who are um, thoroughly. Um, who are who are pursuing this path and are with each other at more or less, you know, in the same way on the same path. Um, there's a I think he understood actually what Gregory Thaumaturgus understood about the friends who were students of origin. Um, so all um, all bound to each other in in the effort to gain more insight and gain is the wrong word here receive more insight i think that's what it means for him thank you thank you very much for the lecture you ended it with uh, with that wonderful passage um that gloss on Exodus 24, telling us that uh, that sapphire uh, that we read about uh, in Exodus 24 refers in some fashion to the constitution of the mind, its purity, its state, when the mind returns to itself from a sort of uh, exile of, of assassinations. So I was wondering, since you ended it like Evagris with a dense, dense statement, if you would first unpack it for us. Um, and then as a commenter on Evagris as Coliast of sorts, um, if you could also mediate a little bit between this way of reading scripture and today, because I could ask, does it mean that when I read Exodus 24, I should have in mind not the elders and Aaron um, and his sons, but the mind. Uh, when I read of ascending Sinai, I should not think of that then and those there, but us or me here and now, um, exclusively together. And what use there is, you think, for that sort of reading today, since the ancients seem to have liked it, but we are at a time in which this might be useful again. Yes. Um, <clears throat> that question, I think, had three parts, and I'm not sure I'll re remember all the parts, so let me just try to address it sort of as a whole. Um, uh, Evangelius, well, no, let me start at the end, uh, if you don't mind. I, I read the quotation from James Kugel because... Um, Kugel asks, um, 
where ha, where where has God gone since the garden, and why do we seem so small and God so far away? Um, that's his. That's the abiding question for Kugel, um, and yet he and he and actually like halachic man, as Soloveitchik writes about halachic man, he believes that God is to be found in the praktike. The praktike, that is, applying oneself to halacha as a praktike, is the beginning of the path to God. There is no other beginning of the path to God. There is no other path, and, and no matter how far one advances up the mountain, so to speak, the halakha and practice are never abandoned. Um, Evagrius does not think that this experience is a different one from the one actually in the Old Testament. He believes it is the same experience because it, because yes, time in the sense of chronos has passed. He knows that, but yet it also has not passed. Um, and what they knew is what we may know. We may know after years of discipline and, um, and the development of insight. Um, how, is it, how is it useful today? Um, uh, well, the short answer is because it's the word that gives life. Um, the longer answer is um, because, um, and I think this is increasingly important now it, it, as, as our age develops in the way that it's developed. Why should I care about what happened on a mountain so long ago? If it had to happen to people so long ago in a language I don't understand, and that the Greeks really didn't understand in the Septuagint, I'm joking. Um, uh, why should it be important to me if it is inaccessible, if I, if it can't be reached? Um, but of course, it can. And Evagrius knew it, and others not not just Evagrius, of course, many others know it. And then the question becomes, how? And the answer, once again, is in the practice. I think that's what I would say. Okay. Please join me again in thanking Dr. I want to acknowledge the presence of two of our hierarchs who have joined us this evening. Uh, we began our day uh, in our seminary chapel, Chapel of Three Hierarchs, our paternal feast today. It's the day that we always have this annual Shmeman lecture. We had three hierarchs serving with us, including his beatitude. So I would like to acknowledge the presence of his grace, uh, Bishop Nicodem, Bishop of Boston and the Albanian Archdiocese. His grace, Bishop Benedict, Bishop of Hartford and the Diocese of New England. I also want to acknowledge the presence of the Dean of St. Tikon Seminary, our sister seminary in South Canaan, Pennsylvania, Father John Parker. Thank you all for your presence, uh, your prayers and support for this seminary as we continue our mission of service to the Orthodox Church. And just once again, thank you so very much for that brilliant lecture.